Hi, hi everyone. Um, yes, I'm happy to present this poster on behalf of our team of six co-authors, led by Ilaria Pescucci, uh, and it also includes Susan Edwards, Uma Gorty, Oliver Gressel, and Takeru Suzuki. Uma and Takeru are with us uh, here in, in uh, Kyoto, and we'll be happy to, to answer uh, your questions and discuss more if you wish after the talk. So uh, this chapter actually covers both observations and theory of disquins, and we have been focusing on a few central questions uh, that have been raised since PP6. What is the empirical evidence for radially extended disquins from protoplanetary disks? Do MHD disquins primarily drive disk accretion? Uh, do photoevaporative disquins primarily drive disk dispersal? And how do disquins affect planet formation and migration? And the chapter focuses on low mass stars because that's where we have the largest body of data uh, from the earliest to the latest phases and new advances since PP6. And I will refer you to our chapter for a more extensive review and references because here I will only be able to give you uh, the few highlights. And I, uh, I apologize in advance if you don't see your, your paper reference here. It's uh, certainly incomplete, but the, the chapter is much more exhaustive. So in terms of observations first, um, the spatially resolved uh, outflows, um, since uh, we have made a lot of progress since PP6, in PP6 we only knew about one case of uh, a source where we had evidence for um, disquins, and this is Digital A, uh, the Titori Star Digital A here. Uh, we had uh, already seen a kind of onion-like structure in velocity where this is the fastest material seen in iron 2 at high velocity. We had a lower velocity cocoon surrounding this jet in iron 2 and in H2 uh, an even lower uh, velocity layer encompassing uh, these components. And then finally with ALMA, uh, recently uh, there was a, a sl an even slower COR flow observed uh, around this. So um, this is this onion-like structure you see is, is in velocity but also in temperature and in chemistry. And since then with ALMA we have been actually finding uh, quite a number of other examples and very spectacular ones especially in the uh, younger sources where the jets are much stronger and the outflows are much more massive. So this is Digital B, a class 1 source, and this is uh, HA212, a class 0 source, even younger. And in each case, you see the jet in the middle, and you see these low velocity flows uh, coming from the inner regions of the disk uh, within a few tens of AUs. And what is uh, important, so we still see uh, this, this onion-like structure, and also we can measure the mass flux, and it's, it's comparable or larger than the accretion rate onto the star. And these airflows are rotating. So this is the... Uh, strongest evidence we have so far for disquins um, in, in these objects. And we also have a spatially unresolved uh, evidence for disquins, and that is in the class 2 stars, where uh, the accretion rates are lower and uh, everything is fainter, but we can still see uh, an ubiquitous low velocity component in the, in the spectrum of the oxygen 1 line. Uh, this is an example here of CW tau, uh, the oxygen one profile, you can see a high velocity component that is tracing the jet, but you can also see this low velocity component here. Um, this low velocity component is slightly blue shifted, it's correlated with the accretion rate very tightly, and so this is uh, strong evidence for a, a slow disk wind. Um, since PP6, there has been um, direct evidence that this is really a disk wind because we see it in spectral astrometry, we can measure the shifts, even though the emission is unresolved, you can see that it's shifted uh, ab slightly above, a few, a few tens of AU above the disk surface and uh, in the blue shifted direction. And there was, there's also evidence for an onion-like structure, uh, in, in a chemical onion-like structure, because uh, we see that there is a, a stronger iron depletion at lower velocities, for example, in this very nice paper. And so it shows that the low velocity component is coming from a larger radii in the disk than the high velocity component. And then finally, uh, with new instruments, uh, we've been able to spectrally resolve these low velocity component profiles, not only in O1, but also in sulfur 2, in H2, and in CO um, near infrared lines. 
And what we find is that uh, there, are, there are two kinds of profiles, actually. Some of them, you, you have to, to have two two Gaussians to reproduce, a broad Gaussian and a narrow Gaussian. And, and I will use these colors uh, in the following to distinguish them. And some other stars you can just fit with a single component. Uh, I call them SC, a single component, and it can be broad or narrow. And if you look at the width of them, and uh, there, it seems to correlate with inclination in a way that is compatible with capillarian rotation. And so if you assume that it's, you're close to capillarian, you get uh, foot point radii that typically go from 0.02 to 5 AU. So really in the, um, in the inner disk, but also going to several AU, uh, quite extended. And we also see that the broad component is bluer than the narrow component, which means that uh, you have faster winds, if you believe this interpretation of the width, uh, you would have faster winds from the smaller disk radii, which is what we see on, on larger scales, okay? We see this onion-like structure with slower and slower wind uh, from larger radii. And finally, if you try to estimate a mass flux, which is hard because you don't spatially resolve the, 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 the emission, but if you assume a reasonable uh, emission size compared to the launch radius, you find that it's, it's uh, actually a bit larger than the jet mass fluxes are comparable, so it's, it's quite sizable. Uh, another new finding since PP6 is the, uh, that there are some evolutionary trends in these low velocity components. Now we have a large body of data, uh, not only for Taurus, but also to older regions like Upper Sco, and we see an evolution as the accretion rate drops and the disk clears. So here, uh, this is showing uh, different kinds of profiles. So uh, the profiles, uh, at, at high accretion rate, you have a lot of these cases where you have the two components plus the jet, but as the accretion rate drops, you tend to go to this uh, other type of profile where you still have the jet in green, but you have a single component. And then at low accretion rates and in the evolved sources like upper SCO, uh, you, you lose the high velocity component altogether and you're left just with a single component. It still has a very broad range of, of width from 10 to 100 kilometer per second, but you see it, it behaves differently with the infrared index than uh, in the early stages. Uh, there is a different slope with the mean infrared. And uh, here, this is full disks on the left, transition disks on the right. You can see that it gets narrower as the disk clears. There is also a sign of evolution when we look at the neon 2 line. The neon 2 uh, line is a trace of hard photons because you need hard photons to ionize neon. And the low velocity component in this line only appears at low accretion rates, below 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. And it increases in strength compared to O1 uh, when the index increases. So as you go from full disks to transition disks, this is the ratio of nitrogen to of neon 2 to 1, sorry, as a function of the slope. And you can see all these thick disks here. Uh, the low velocity component is just not detected. It starts to be in only a few sources. And as you go to transition disks, then you, you, you clearly see this component and it becomes more and more important compared to O1. Um, now in the chapter, we also review the basics of the disk wind theory. Uh, for those who were not in the previous PP uh, sessions, uh, I'm just going to do a very brief recap. Uh, so we have two kinds of disk winds, the, uh, the magnetocentrifugal MHD disk winds and the photoevaporative winds. Um, the magnetocentrifugal ones are predominantly powered by magnetic forces which drive accretion in the disk. And this is, this is a, um, a typical simulation from Oliver Gressel showing how the magnetic field lines are wound up by disk rotation, uh, they break the disk, they allow accretion in the disk, but they also accelerate the material in the wind. And the final velocity of the wind here depends on what we call the magnetic lever arm parameter, which we denote as lambda. It is not the same as the mass to flux ratio in course. Uh, <laughs> be careful. Uh, it's the ratio of the uh, specific angular momentum extracted by the wind to the initial Keplerian momentum in the disk. And it's, it's related to what we call the lever arm, I mean, the, the alpha and radius. But this is the important uh, parameter that controls everything in those disk winds. And uh, the photoevaporative winds, in contrast, are powered predominantly by stellar irradiation uh, from X-rays, from the corona of the star, 
EUV from chromospheric uh, activity and far UV from the accretion shock onto the stellar surface. And this creates a, a hot disk surface with a pressure gradient and this can lift material and make it escape from the disk if the uh, sound speed is large enough compared to the Keplerian speed, um, which correspond to escape radii of at least one to four AU. Uh, inside of that, uh, you remain bound to the disk and you have no photo evaporation. So these photo evaporative winds start uh, beyond a few AU and the final speed is a few times the sound speed. So going so I'm going to go a bit deeper into the MHD disk winds. What's new since PP6? Well, there has been a lot of work, um, uh, very impressive progress with 2D and 3D semi-global and global simulations of these uh, disk winds, which we didn't have then. And they show that MHD disk winds are a robust outcome of organized poloidal disk fields in the disk. As soon as you put these vertical field lines, you get MHD disk winds even when the mid-plane magnetization is low. Uh, and there are two regimes which have been discussed uh, by Mario this morning. The, the, first regimes, uh, the first regime is when the, the disk is dead, so uh, what we call the dead zone here, uh, due to um, non-ideal effects, the MRI is quenched, and so the disk is, is, is uh, laminar. And here you can still eject the winds from the disk surface where uh, the gas recouples to the magnetic field because it's sufficiently irradiated and beta becomes of order one. So even if beta is very large here, you have a very, um, the thermal pressure is dominant here, there is a region at the disk surface where the densities are lower and eventually be beta is of order one. And this was already shown by, a, uh, seen by, um, in Turing box simulations and now it's confirmed with these global simulations. And the second regime is the ideal MHD uh, MRI active regime. So you expect this in the inner regions as Mario showed this morning, for example, you will get uh, uh, an unstable MRI instability, turbulence, and here you expect to have a different kind of wind that is going to be fed by these uh, fluctuations and uh, up upflows and this was shown by uh, Shuichiro Inutsuka, Inutsuka uh, and it's confirmed now with these large-scale simulations. Um, going in a bit more into the outer disk winds from the dead zone, so these global simulations have made uh, huge progress because now they include multiple non-ideal non -ideal MHD effects, so ohmic, uh, ambipolar and whole effect. They include XUV radiation, they include thermochemistry. I'm putting here a few references. This is really beautiful work and um, just to, to remind the people who are a bit old like me, I mean, you've heard about these old models where we had a beta midplane of one. What's the difference? Well, there are some similarities. They, they, they drive sonic accretion still with an accretion rate that is proportional to BZ. That's really important. And the key parameter is still this lambda parameter and it still controls the, the, the kinematics and the, the mass flux. So this is, uh, looks familiar, but there are these notable differences too that now you can have a massive disk because it's non-accreting in the mid-plane. Uh, before, in these early models, uh, it was accreting down the mid-plane at sonic speed, so you'd never had enough surface density to build planets, but now you can have uh, a dense mid-plane to build planets and you eject from the surface. So you eject from much higher four scale heights with a much larger B5, also the, the, the wound up field. So you get uh, smaller uh, level arms, slower winds, more massive winds. And also you can get asymmetric winds. This is a, a simulation by uh, Riols. And, and notice this is density. Notice that the wind is much denser on the top part of the disk and less dense there. Um, and this is driven by non-ideal MHD. There is a poster that, um, by the way, in green I'm showing poster numbers that I found relevant. I'm sorry if I missed yours, but I tried to be uh, pretty complete. Um, and then there are also global simulations of what happens when you have these vertical magnetic fields in a transition disk. So if you have an inner hole, you, you will also drive uh, accretion, sonic accretion through those inner holes. Uh, and you will have properties closer to these early models with a beta midplane of one or so. Uh, and it's very, very interesting to see that you can sustain a steady, steady accretion uh, through these um, transition disks. 
Now going to the inner winds from the MRI zone. Again, here we have these new, uh, very impressive 3D ideal imaging global simulations, including MRI. And there are two main uh, results. First, when just lo look at large scale, uh, far from the star, uh, what you see is that this MRI disk is actually driving upflows into this thick atmosphere, uh, but still the atmosphere is, is uh, there is a breaking torque and it, it, it doesn't escape, but it falls back. So it, it's called failed winds. Uh, you can see they're they are really important here. And then uh, even higher, uh, above 45 degrees, uh, here you can get an accelerating torque and a conical disk wind. So you have these two components, uh, and the, the disk wind here only carries about 10% of the accretion rate, because the rest is done by the MRI and by these failed winds that accrete onto the central object. So you expect uh, much smaller uh, mass fluxes. And when you include the star, this is a beautiful simulation by Takasao. There is a poster on this that you can check. Uh, when you add the stellar field, you get additional contributions to outflow, like uh, magnetospheric ejections when the, uh, the stellar field lines reconnect by interacting with the disk. And you can also get a stellar wind, of course. Uh, so all of these are going to interact with the conical disk winds and uh, probably contribute to the jets that we observe. Um, it's clear that uh, a very important point to keep in mind is that uh, since it is uh, the, the, the breaking, the, the magnetic field breaking torque that produces uh, accretion uh, in, in the, um, the dead zone uh, disk winds, it's the poloidal field strength that is going to determine the accretion rate. And this is an approximate expression just from first principles, very approximative. Um, you, you, can, you can do, uh, there are better scalings, uh, more precise scalings in the Lezure chapter, uh, but just to show you that uh, the typical field strength that you could uh, advect during the collapse phase could be sufficient to sustain accretion, uh, pretty high accretion rates, but then the question is what happens uh, later on. So the flux diffusion is really, as Mario said, is a very crucial question because that is going to regulate the MHD disk winds and, and how much accretion you get. And the current results that uh, Mario showed was that in the dead zone, there seems to be an outward diffusion uh, in the midplane, whereas in the MRI zone, it's inward midplane diffusion. But there are many open questions still to, to address, like, you know, these are still early times. Um, we would like to know how it, it evolves on secular time scales. Also, what happens at the wind base? Because we see these disk winds are coming from several scale heights, like four, time, four scale heights, or even more in the uh, MRI region. Uh, what happens there? Is the flux diffusion the same, or could it be slower? Um, and also the effect of alpha dynamos and stellar field, could that induce some cyclic behaviors? All of that is really open to research. Now, the photoevaporative disk winds, um, the main new result since PP6 is um, very nice simulations coupling hydrodynamics with heating, uh, with the different kinds of photons, and chemistry and cooling. And here you can see a, a, an example of a simulation by Komaki showing how this produces a, a complex, very complex wind structure with a, a, a very hot, highly ionized wind in the middle, uh, a neutral X-ray driven uh, wind uh, atomic uh, at intermediate uh, angles and then uh, at the disk surface a much cooler wind uh, it's more like a PDR um, PDR like uh, flow uh, that is atomic or molecular um, the, the, the difficulty here is that the results depend very much on the adopted microphysics and radiative transfer there are some simulations where this uh, division here uh, or even these two uh, ends up at the disk surface. So it, it, it is extremely sensitive, of course, because um, the wind, uh, th these thermodynamical properties feed on the wind and vice versa. Um, so that's really something that uh, we need to understand better, you know, w uh, how to do this, uh, yeah, in, in the most rigorous way possible while coupling to hydrodynamics. It's a very challenging problem. Um, there's a new, uh, new work also coupling the dust dynamical evolution, viscous evolution, and photoevaporation to evaluate this dispersal. Uh, coupling with dust is really important because you expect the dust to evolve, to settle, to grow, 
to drift, and this is affecting the heating. Um, for example, the photoelectric heating is going to change. The radiative, um, the pho photon absorption is going to change. So you want to have a soft, consistent uh, evolutionary model. Uh, and that's also something that uh, needs to be uh, pursued. Um, in terms of mass fluxes, has, how does that translate? In our chapter, we give a full compilation uh, of different models uh, in terms of the mass flux per uh, log r as a function of radius. And here, I won't discuss all of these in detail because I don't have time, and I refer you to the chapter for a full discussion. But the takeaway message is the following. Uh, for the inner winds from the inner AU, uh, for the MHD ones, uh, which are not uh, plotted here, the MRI-driven um, winds have a, are predict a, a few percent of M dot accretion for the, the MHD disk winds, depending on magnetization. And there are no photoevaporative winds because they are gravity bound. And this is what you see here in this curve. Basically, the mass flux goes to, plummets to zero. Uh, for the outer winds, in the dead zone, the MHD models predict uh, a flat, relatively flat curve here, where uh, basically this um, mass flux per log R is, is of order the accretion rate. Uh, for the uh, photoevaporative winds, it's somewhere between 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 8. This is where you can see the, the effect of, of, of assumptions. And there is an additional point that has not been considered before in PP6 is that these inner winds could absorb uh, part of the XUV photons from the star. And so uh, this could quench the photoevaporation at sufficiently high accretion rates if you have 10% of that in an inner wind. Um, so what are the uh, implications for this dispersal? Uh, is it due to MHG disk winds or to photoevaporative disk winds? Uh, I heard this question uh, this morning. Uh, so this morning we heard about uh, scenarios where the, the dissipation was either purely viscous or pure MHD. Uh, and here uh, we are showing uh, two scenarios. Uh, of first, a pure, uh, where we include photoevaporation. Uh, this one is the classical scenario of pure viscous accretion and photoevaporation, but it takes into account the variation of, of accretion rate uh, changing the far UV flux, and it also takes into account the effect of absorption by the inner wind. And so you see this dramatic effect here that lowers the accretion, uh, the photoevaporative rate until relatively late stages. So uh, you're dominated by accretion, uh, mass removal by accretion until the, uh, the late phases. And then finally, the final clearing is done by um, far UV driven photoevaporation. Uh, in the second scenario in blue, uh, there is a, a vertical disk field, and there is a very strong MHG disk wind, and that is dominating the mass removal from the disk until the very late stages as well, a few million years. But finally, you get photoevaporation taking over. Uh, you see when the accretion, um, when the, uh, the mass flux of the wind, uh, of the MHG wind drops below 10 to the minus 8 or so, uh, you start to be dominated by photoevaporation. So from these scenarios, it seems that in the late stages, photoevaporation could still dominate, even though you have um, MHD-controlled accretion uh, throughout in earlier stages. Uh, now confronting observations with theory. Uh, in terms of the spatially resolved observations, there is a strong agreement with MHD disk winds so far. Uh, at least. Uh, you have seen already in chapter 9 these beautiful AMA observations that have detected now jet rotation in one jet here, uh, HH212 in SIO, in the same sense as the disk, in different nodes, uh, same direction, and it implies an origin from 0.05 to 0.2 AU, uh, and this is where we have the MRI disk winds and the star disk interaction. So that that is probably, um, we know that jets are coming from pretty inner, uh, really the inner, inner disk. And I point you to some recent reviews about jets and their origin here. Um, at lower velocity, we have these broad conical outflows. And here, this is a map of the uh, centroid velocity in HH212, where you nicely see this uh, velocity gradient showing rotation. Um, this is uh, also seen in uh, all the other CO outflows that have been observed pretty much so far. Um, 
And the mass fluxes are extremely large, as I mentioned already. They're of the same order as the accretion rate, so it's much too large for evaporation. Uh, there is an onion-like structure here that is well fitted by readily extended MAG disquin models. And I'll point you to these papers if you want to see a very detailed comparison of these observations with an MAG disquin model. It, it works really uh, surprisingly well. Uh, but more generally, uh, if you look at the, uh, the foot points, the lambda values and the, the mass fluxes, they are in line with MAG disquins uh, driving accretion across the dead zone. So to show you uh, how we derive these launch points and, and, uh, and magnetic uh, level arms, this is, uh, it's actually relatively easy. So you plot the poloidal velocity of your flow here on the x-axis, the specific angular momentum, RV phi, on the y-axis. Uh, and these are the uh, observed data points in all of these uh, rotating CO outflows. And you compare with uh, predictions from MHD disquins. The, uh, the solid curves are different values of lambda. The dashed curves are different value of the launch radius in AU. And so you, from each point, you can derive uh, which, which value uh, you need to explain the observations. And you see that we have small values of lambda, large values of R0. And this is exactly what is predicted by these MHD disquin models from the dead zone. Low, small lambda values and large are not. Uh, also, you can go a bit further if you have a, a handle on the range of launch radii, like here at Digital B, we managed to do a, a tomographic analysis of the flow to derive the, the velocity and the rotation in the different layers. We did the same in HH212 with this detailed model, and uh, we did the same in HH30. And if you know also the mass flux and the mass accretion rate, you can check that the, uh, the, the, the amount of angular momentum you remove in these disquins is exactly what you need to feed accretion through uh, the launch zone. And so this has been done in, in, in three outflows so far. So if you're interested, you can check those references. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, uh, going to unresolved tracers, so the low velocity component in class two. Uh, are these MHD or photoevaporative winds? Um, so here, uh, these are predicted uh, line profiles for the different kinds of winds. For MHD disquins, MHD disquins predict quite complex, broad and complex profiles with multiple components. Uh, here I'm showing a really old, uh, <laughs> really old result, but uh, it's the only one I found that had uh, a superposition with observations that was uh, not too crowded. Uh, but uh, there are similar results that have been found uh, in different, uh, like in by Weber, for example. Uh, there are also predictions for molecular lines, uh, and also in uh, two posters you can see also predictions for different kinds of MHD wind models. But they all predict these complex profiles with. Uh, often two components. Uh, the photoevaporative winds, they predict narrow lines uh, for the reasons I said that uh, you have to be beyond a few AU to, to escape from the potential well. Uh, there are slight differences between EUV and X-ray driven, but uh, yeah, they look pretty similar. So how does that compare with, with observations? Well, uh, you remember that some sources have pretty broad, low velocity components, uh, sometimes just a broad component actually, uh, that can go up to 100 kilometer per second wide. So uh, clearly MHG disquins would be favored for these ones. And even those that have two, bro both a broad and a narrow component, these two components seem to be cross correlated in, in velocity, in strength. And so we feel that it's, it's more realistic to think that they come both from the same phenomenon, an MHG disquin, than MHD plus photoevaporation because of these correlations. But of course, this is a matter of discussion. Um, now, in the evolved sources where you only have, you know, the, I don't know if you remember this graph as a function of the infrared index, but when you go to the, uh, the clearing disks and the low accretion rates, you end up uh, with a single narrow component and and, and then those are compatible with uh, photoevaporation. And this is TW Hydra, an example of a well-known transition disk. Uh, you can see that the, the black histogram is the observations. You can see that it, it's very well fitted. And 
what is interesting is that this low velocity component of neon 2 is only seen at low accretion rates. So it, it fits with the idea that um, um, that's when the inner winds become transparent to the, uh, to the energetic photons. Now, what is the impact of disk winds on planet formation? I'm only going to skim through the surface here because there's a lot of work and it's a very, very important and very interesting topic that has seen a lot of advance also since PP6. Um, it has a, an Im to impact in many ways. First, it tends to promote planetesimal formation in, uh, through different, uh, different effects. First, increasing the dust to gas ratio between, because these winds are going to lift up the small grains, but they're going to leave the big grains behind. Typically, uh, the maximum grain size that is entrained is about 10 microns. Um, so that's going to increase the dust to gas ratio in the mid plane and favor planetesimal accretion. Uh, the radial drift can be slowed or reversed by uh, the gas removal and also the uh, altered surface density distribution if you create an inner gap. There is also the formation of rings and gaps by non-ideal effects that Mario showed us uh, this morning, and that uh, is illustrated here in the simulation. And these vortices can lead to trapping of, of solids uh, and enhanced planetesimal formation. And there are more, more effects and, and several posters here that are discussing this question. There is also an impact on planet formation and migration. Um, Again, because of this inverted surface density slope uh, and cavity opening, you can actually uh, slow down or revert the migration uh, and explain the formation of, of uh, closing super-Earth and sub-Neptunes. This is a poster uh, and paper by Ogihara uh, where you, and body simulations where, where you can see uh, these different uh, embryos interacting and merging together. And it also leads to the formation of non-resonant systems, uh, which is uh, also, you can reproduce the observed uh, orbital separations better um, than when you have rapid uh, inward migration. Um, if the disk is, is, is non-turbulent, it's totally inviscid, there are also some interesting effects uh, with vortices, but yeah, I won't have time to elaborate, but there is a, a lot of interesting work, uh, hydro simulations about that also. Um, so, just uh, a last word about future progress. Um, in, on, on, the, on observations, we need more of these high-resolution spectroimaging studies to really probe the internal wind structure. And there are lots of ongoing, uh, I was really happy to see the number of, of posters that are showing ALMA observations of the base of, of, of these winds. Uh, there are many, many posters, uh, several of them report rotation. Uh, there, are, there is uh, an example here in HL Tau where you start to resolve some su interesting substructure in the outflow um, related maybe to the disk structure. There are also, with JWST, we're able now to probe the H2 component of these flows uh, and also different atomic lines from the jet. So it's, it's bringing us again a different view, intermediate temperature regime uh, between the, the, the jets and the CO. Uh, that is going to be very interesting to study. Uh, again, that's one example of a poster. Uh, the optical is also bringing uh, really, really nice information. And uh, in particular, there is one poster with a detection of O1 low velocity component from PDS-70. Uh, that is quite surprising in a way, I mean, it, but very interesting. So uh, check that. Uh, we would also like, of course, to see B-field, oh, Ah. Oops. Right. Okay, sorry. Um, we would like, in, on the theory side, to expand the global simulations uh, to see the interaction of inner and outer disk winds, um, which has not been studied so far because it's either MRI zone or dead zone. And uh, it would be nice to have both of them together and see how they play out and if there are some signatures of their interactions. Uh, to go to younger class zero one sources and later class two when photoevaporative winds may start to dominate, uh, see how that looks in, in, in synthetic predictions, and also pursue the role of winds in the evolution of solids and planet migration. And of course, the ultimate goal is to reach comprehensive theory of the role of disk winds uh, in disk accretion and uh, architecture of planetary systems. 
So I'll just put here a quick summary of the current results um, that are in the chapter. And thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you very much, Sylvie. So you know the drill, line up. Um, and I would encourage um, more junior people to come up. Don't be afraid. Ask some questions. So let's start over there. Is that okay? Ah, okay. Ah, Hiro Takami from Azie. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. But as my student is here, so I have a duty to argue against your statement about, I mean, what you say is the disc wind nature for the forbidden line LVC is confirmed based on so Emma Williams' observations. So there are four points I want to so address, actually. And first, Emma's, Emma Williams' study is only for two objects. So we definitely need to increase the samples. My student, Yuri Cho, and also Emma's students are trying to do that. Sure. This is the first Absolutely. point. Absolutely. It's yes. only two sources so far. You are right. OK. Yes. And the second point, that some part of the emission could be associated with disk atmosphere rather than okay, the LBC wind. So please have a look at Cho Yuri's poster. And then Yuri Cho's poster, okay. the PF03, the 0.4. And uh, we are happy to take your criticism. Like, <laughs> so yeah. which one is it? The, yeah, very last one. This one? Yes. OK. Yes. OK. Um, yes. yes. In Emma's data, there was a, a shift uh, from the, uh, there was a, a spatial shift between the low velocity centroids and the disk midplane, I guess. But you're right. I mean, clearly, these low velocity components, anyway, they have to be formed right quite close to the disk surface because the, the centroids are not very large. So uh, if they are dominated by rotation, they still have to be the base of the disk wind. So yeah, it's... it's uh, OK, the third too. point is some ex people argue the features could be explained by, the, all the LBC features could be explained by X wind model, and uh, so including interaction with ambient gas based on their, their latest paper, shown at, at all 2023 in APJ. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, so they haven't done so any simulation of the emission lines. So we might be keeping so our thoughts open for this possibility. That's the third, third point. Yes. The first point is you mentioned some ALMA observations. Yeah, sorry, could you, could you, but for should, ALMA, so we usually cover young, uh, younger, ob younger objects. So it's very different. So maybe conditions will be very different so from, so between what we can see using ALMA and what we observe using optical forbidden line emission. Yeah, that's why, that's why I separated spatially resolved and unresolved. Actually, with ALMA, we see also a wind like this. Well, HL Tau is, OK, a young Titori star. We also have an outflow from HH30, which is a, a class 2 source. And actually, there's been, it's an edge on class 2. And there's been observations of veiling in that source, and it's not heavily veiled. So I don't know if you consider HH30 to be a very young source, but there is no sign of an envelope around that one, around HH30. That's now, yeah, okay. I'd like to address the point on the X-Wind because I think it's an important okay. Okay. point. So I have a slide about it. I prepared it. So if that's OK, unless Peter wants to ask. But yeah, this is what you're referring to. I mean, th this is the, um, yeah, there, there have been um, models trying to explain uh, these outflows by untrained material by the X-wind. And what it, the X-wind is, is a model where there is no magnetic field in the disk itself. And so the inner wind is actually uh, at a constant velocity, but it's going at 180 degrees. It's very widely open. And then it interacts freely with uh, the envelope. So, so there, there is no thick MRI disk. Uh, you know, it's, it's a simple model. And, and then the envelope or the ambient core is swept up into a shell. And these are, there are different models for these, um, numerical simulations, uh, um, analytical, semi-analytical work. And the caveats with this interpretation, there are several caveats. First, the rotation that is predicted is less than observed. And this has been shown, for example, in Lopez Vasquez. Um, I forgot to put here the De Vallon uh, paper, they compare with the predicted uh, rotational velocities, and they don't match. Um, there is a second problem. It's the, the base radius here 
this is a simulation at a thousand years and you can see that the base radius here is already 150 AU. That's because the X-wind has such strength, uh, even though it's, it's denser on the axis, it's still, there's still material going off at the equator at 150 or you know, close to 100 km per second that pushes against uh, the ambient medium, skims over the disk surface, and even in, in steady models, uh, like the Liang model, you get a base radius that is about the outer disk radius. And that is not what we observe. We observe base radii of 10 AU or so. Or, you know. So that is something quite difficult to explain with the, uh, this X-wind uh, model. If you try to, to constrain that, if you want to add a disk field to, to, to pinch that, you need such a strong disk field that you will drive an MSG disk wind, actually. So that, that is all discussed in the chapter. There, there is a whole section about this, if you want. And we can talk about it uh, together later. Okay, let's, um, I'm going to move around this way, and let's try and keep the questions short and uh, so we can get through more people. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, Yao Lun Yan, uh, Riken in Japan. Um, I have a question about your uh, future prospect show the uh, substructure in alpha, and we also seen previous talk about using substructure in alpha to indicate uh, potential outbursts. Can you comment on how or could we distinguish these two phenomena? Um, so you are referring to the which? HL Tau CO that you yeah, show yeah. here. Yeah, but you're referring to which talk? Uh, Agnes talk on the. Ah, yeah, Agnes talk. Yes. Um, yeah. So there, there are two. Actually, yeah, it's still a matter of uh, you know debate even within ourselves uh, whether is this due to. I mean, there are several possible origins for these substructures. Um, one is that it's related, uh, and that's in the poster, if you go check that poster, that it might be related to the ring structure in the disk, you know, that the self-organization in the disks uh, that is going to produce uh, denser wind layers compared to others, so that could make substructure. Um, there is another option, which is that uh, you have um, episodic uh, accretion, higher accretion at the disk surface. There is a poster showing uh, that in the supersonic uh, or sonic accretion layer, you can actually have sometimes fluctuations in the uh, accretion rate uh, when you put the radiative transfer. And this could lead to enhancements in the, uh, the outflow uh, at some, some times. So that's in the De Vallon paper on Digital B, you can find uh, a modeling of that effect. And the third possible effect is this one, which is the interaction between the time variable jet and an outer disk wind. Uh, if you have outbursts in the jets, uh, that creates bow shocks. These bow shocks could interact with the disk wind, and they can also produce substructure. This is a paper by uh, Tabon in 2018. Uh, and, and it produces, uh, it can also produce, yeah, like, you know, structures in the over-dense over -dense structures along the, 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 the alpha surface. And we think we may be seeing such an interaction in HH212, perhaps. Thank and you. there is a poster on HH30 that uh, discusses okay. that. And, uh, yes, go Ahmed Nimmer from NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful review about uh, the squins. Um, my question is um, uh, about MHD winds. You classify them as uh, magnetocentrifugal. And as far as I know, most models are based on very thin disk um, uh, models, basically, for, for disk structure. And in this case, it's really hard to reconcile how this um, gas can be ionized to be carried away by the magnetic field. So can you please comment on that? Actually, the 2D and 3D simulations are, are not using such thin, they're not so thin. Um, if you look at, Geoffroy can probably comment more, but they, they, they take a, um, Geoffroy, can you comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> He's the expert. <laughs> um, right, so um, in this particular case, yes, uh, most of the models published to date have an aspect ratio of 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, and the, the one we see here is 0.05. And I should say also that we always assume that there is some sort of strong ionization due to the far UVs at the disk surface, which is enough to provide the coupling to the magnetic field lines, which mm -hmm. then make an outflow, mm -hmm. if this addresses your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. 
So it, it, you, what you're saying is that we would need to have self-consistent, fully self-consistent uh, calculation of the irradiation of the disk surface. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Greg Herzig, Peking University. Uh, thank you for the fantastic summary and uh, very clear descriptions. Uh, I was wondering about your, an observational take on one of the theoretical predictions that you discussed. Uh, and it, it seems like the non-ideal uh, simulations of accretion uh, from reals. Also, there's a poster from Shoji Mori. Uh, and I think even the star disk interaction from Takasao-san, who's behind me, show that the wind comes out and the opposite side of the accretion, right? So the accretion flow is on the top and the wind comes out on the bottom. Yeah. And I was wondering, it seems like that should be observationally testable, uh, challenging because we can't see the backside sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering whether you could kind of speculate on what, whether the observations support that or not. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the very good question. Um, observationally, at least we have examples of uh, highly asymmetric outflows, that's for sure, like DigitalB that I showed, it's, it's much stronger on one side. HH30, I didn't show it, but you can check the, the papers. It's only also on one side. Um, so at least that is seen. Now, about uh, having the accretion mostly on the other side, uh, that's where I said we need to have a way to measure this sonic accretion at the disk surface. So, yeah, it would be great if there was a way to, to, to look for that. In HH30, uh, it's difficult because it's edge-on and it's a very thick disk, so uh, there's a dust lane. I don't think you can see the, uh, you can't see the surface. You do. But in Digital B, the, uh, the outflow is on the redshifted side, so if we could watch the, we, we could look for a sonic accretion on the blue-shifted uh, face of the disk. Yeah. Thanks. I have lots of questions about that, but I'm not the questioner, so you are, over there. Uh, Peter Wojtke, Graz, Austria. My question is about stellar wind. Is, isn't there also a stellar wind? I mean, these stars, these young two Taurus stars are huge X-ray emitters, sure. they have very strong activity, they should also have corona, etc., just like the sun. Do you know of, of any works that are trying to combine this, or do you think it's just not relevant? I could imagine the master loss rates cannot compete, but maybe the loss of energy, if, if, if you think about energy loss rate, so is it possible that maybe these, all these things get again shaped by a stellar wind? Yeah, that's exactly, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if the, the label probably doesn't show very well, I'm sorry about that, but here there is a stellar wind actually in this simulation. And, um, and do these people actually try to have a full consistent it is hydro model with a generation of a stellar wind as well? So, well, the generation of the stellar wind is, a, is another, it's a difficult issue because you need to put some heating here, but you don't know what to put. Then, you know, even the solar wind we have trouble uh, doing, so uh, what in Titori stars, you know? Uh, but you, you, you can try to put, uh, to put some arbitrary heating here. So. Right now, the, the, the consensus is that the problem is for the stellar wind to get mass, to get mass out of the star, you, you need to climb a very steep potential well. So uh, you cannot get uh, as much mass as from the, uh, the, the magnetospheric ejections. It's much easier because you reconnect close to the co-rotation point. So you're already a uh, few stellar radii away, so the, not as deep the potential well. The disk winds, again, are also easier. But you're right that it could contribute to like, you know, pushing against uh, these field lines. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, maybe, maybe Takasao can comment, I don't know if it changes the, the characteristics of the, the conical winds, uh, conical disk winds that are there. Uh, but definitely that is, uh, I mean, it's really the, the, the direction to go. But uh, the problem is how much mass flux to put in there. Okay, I'm so, we're really tight, so I'm, I'm sorry. I can only take one question. I know you've been waiting for a long time, so go ahead. Thank you very much. Megan Ryder, Rice University. Thanks for a great talk. I was just wondering if you could say a few words about what people are thinking about um, lower metallicities, especially now that we know of at least one collimated jet and a handful of molecular outflows seen in the Magellanic clouds, albeit not with this uh, incredible uh -huh. spatial resolution. Wow. I didn't think of that at all. <laughs> mm. And there is a molecular, yeah, I don't even know about the data, but you have a molecular outflow around. 
the jet. And do you see any difference from what I showed here, or does it look similar? Uh, I think Keik Tanaka's poster is really the one to check out for that. And okay. Cloud has a paper on a jet seen in optical wavelengths. Happy to okay. chat after. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let's thank Sylvia again. <laughs>